We're in Nebraska talking with Rusty Nelson, and people would be very happy to know he is alive and well. Why? <laughs> because there's a lot of people worried about no. you. Could you just give us some background on how it came about that you ended up on the registry? Well, um, I was arrested for taking pictures of a minor, and they couldn't produce the minor. They couldn't produce the pictures, anything like that. Um, I had been associated with the Franklin Credit Union, and they would basically followed me all over the country. I lived in my van for years. I didn't stay hardly anywhere more than three weeks, and then I, I would move somewhere else. And um, I just wanted to distance myself from Franklin. I, it wasn't my actions that, in Franklin. It was just that I was an innocent bystander that was drug into the picture. Now, if people want to know more on the background of that, they can read uh, Senator John DeCamp's book, The Franklin Cover-Up. Yeah, yeah. They, and, can, uh, they can read that. Or, and you were only involved in that for a brief time, actually. Yeah, about a year. About a year. Yeah. But as a consequence... Uh, 87, 88. You became a target for... Uh, oh, a lot. <laughs> it was a witch hunt, is what they made it into. And anybody I worked with, I made sure that they had proper ID and that they were over 18 or of legal age in the state wherever I was in. And, you know, I have no problem shooting nudes or anything like that. Um, I look at it as in the human form, it's is a piece of art. And everybody's special in their own unique way. And there are a lot of females who want some uh, oh, they want, they want the attention this. of the oh, yeah. modeling portfolio and mm -hmm. and uh, even if they are underage they might bend the rules without... Well, the, they'll, you know, like in my case they said the girl gave me a fake ID. And, you know, I said, well, who's the girl? You know, show me the girl and show me what the deal is on this. and. They couldn't. So you can respond. How do you yeah, respond to charges like their, that? Their charges, the other thing was, I said, no, well, I get the chance to face my accuser in court. And they said, no, because she's a minor, she doesn't have to testify and she does not have to. But couldn't they at least give you, because you said you had signed forms. Yes. And, and they even admitted you had a signed form, mm -hmm. uh, consent form. Yes. And couldn't they at least give you some tangible proof that there was some justifiable reason to charge you with anything? Yeah. You know, and that's the thing. I was very tenacious about getting releases. And on the release it says under penalty of perjury, they affirm that they are of 18 or they're of full legal age. And, um, you know, I was just totally, totally at a loss, and even if you took nude photos of, of uh, underage girls, did, did you ever engage with sex within it? No. With them? No. So you're just thrown in jail mm -hmm. under these extreme circumstances, yeah. and no, no means to financial means. Yeah. Oh, they wiped me out. They wiped me out. Um, they. I had over a quarter million pictures with me when I was arrested and I was moving back home and they confiscated my van, my camper and all the pictures. I, I didn't get a single picture back. Um, and I, those were pictures mostly of? Scenery. These were National Geographic quality pictures. Um, you know, I, I'm very, very meticulous with my photography work when it comes to the scenics especially. And a lot of these were historic pictures. Um, I had pictures of this, that, and the next thing. A uh, cattle drive. Um, all these different types of things. And they're just gone. And, and what justification did they give for keeping think, the pictures that were not related to the charges? Oh, they... Um, 
they kept saying, well, they were misplaced and this and that and the next thing. Basically what happened is they were destroyed because there were, were pictures of Franklin in there. And John DeCamp even seen some of them. He was the only person on my side who actually got in to see the pictures before they were destroyed. So do you think that all in all that this whole um, targeting of you is basically to discredit you because of your relationship with the Franklin scandal oh, yes. and oh, yes. and nothing to, whatsoever to do with actual um, sexual offenses. No, you get these um, uh, prosecuting attorneys that will go to great lengths because they have endless means. You know, they can, oh, we can justify it because of this or that, or we're protecting the public. And to defend yourself, you have very limited means. Yeah, they give you a public pretender, or what's supposedly known as a public defender. Um, these are people who are often overworked. Um, uh, in the case in, in Oregon, they got a set amount for doing the case. So it was basically just enough to where they would go in long enough to get a plea bargain out of somebody and do the paperwork and that's all they were getting paid for. So they didn't want to go in and get a case that is going to be involved that they're going to have to put a lot of time and effort and money into. And I, if I remember right, I can't... Uh, I believe it was $756 is what the lawyer got for doing the case, which is nothing. And I was told the conviction rate on plea bargain in Multnomah County in, in Oregon was 98.6% that were found guilty by plea bargain. So it's pretty much an assembly line. Yeah, and on mine, I took it as a no contest because I was told that I'd be able to open it up again and fight it once I had the means to do so and they wouldn't do it. Um, it was just open and shut and um, anything you try to do to help yourself they won't allow you to do. Um, they say they have a law library. That's a joke. Um, law library in, in the jails is always outdated, usually by 10 years or more. And these laws have changed. You may spend your time going through the law books, looking up things. They do not have a photocopier or anything else. Um, you might get a typewriter. If it works is another story or if they have a ribbon for it. Um, you're lucky if you know how to run a typewriter. Most don't. Now the state of mind they uh, while you're in jail is manipulated and oh, it, uh, exactly. so you're not at your optimum to, to be able to fight it. Yeah, they had me to where they, they came around and woke me up every 15 minutes to a half hour and they would do this continuously for days on end and actually weeks on end and you just are not yourself and you know different forms of mental illness set in they send you down to the doctor the doctor prescribes you medication you start taking this medication and that in hopes of getting better and all you end up doing is becoming an addict to it you've got to have it um, because getting off of it or going without it induces seizures, induces um, withdrawals, all these things. You'll have to help that down so a these bit. are some of the medications you take on a daily basis. That's a day's worth. And um, oh. that's how much that's, of it's one day's that's worth. That's a day's worth. That one row. Yeah. And so this is morning, and, noon, and night, or? And then there's another set that goes with it. I have four, four times a day. What do you mean another set that goes with it? Well, there's a few other pills that I take 
and I only got three slots. Well, can you kind of explain what they are? What's that pretty, okay. pretty blue and green one? Oh, that's Cymbalta. That's the new miracle wonder, wonder drug for um, anti-depression. And myself, I don't think it really does much, but they like to prescribe it. Um, let's see. Oh, you got a gel cap there. I don't remember what that one is. Is that a right vitamin? Off. Um, this one here is uh, uh, a little red guy. Yeah. Uh, Lyrica. That's for seizures and that. And that's the other thing that Cymbalta is supposed to help with. And then um, uh, Geodon. That's because all the tra trauma I'd went through in jail on that, uh, you know, they say it's for anti-schizophrenia. You know, there's some of this stuff I've, I've had. It's well over $20 a pill <sighs> and have to take it four times a day. And I'm hoping somebody's helping foot the bill. Yeah. and Which ones are those? I don't have it in here right now. What kind of uh, medications were you on before you were uh, incarcerated? Nothing. And how many medications are you on, or how many did you become placed on under incarceration? Fifty-four. Different medications? Prescriptions. Simultaneously? Yeah. It's a lot of pills. And were they forcibly... Uh, some some were um, they wanted to give me a shot when I when I they had me in prison um, and I wouldn't let them do it because I was advised by the lawyer not to. Well, they came and forcibly um, gave it to me anyway, and then they threw me in a cell on the west side of the prison with a large window and it was in August or September and it was just hot as all get out. There was no ventilation in there. Well now how did they force you to take this injection? They they took four guys and held me down. And were you threatened if you didn't? With shotguns, two shotguns. <laughs> Aimed at you yes, at the time? Yes, And what did they say? He said, you are going to take it, and, and you are going to get it, and that's all there is to it. And if you don't? And if you don't, if you resist, we will shoot you. And they meant it. Oh, they meant it. <laughs> and what do you think was in that injection? I don't remember what the, what the shot was even for anymore. But you said it was supposed to be like a tuberculosis. Yeah, a tuberculosis is what it was. But it was a real... Yeah, it was a larger needle than, it was like a 16 gauge needle, which was a very large needle for something like that. That's more of the size they get plasma from. And, you know, the tuberculosis shot is a very fine needle. So either they were wanting to inflict pain or I don't know what was in the syringe. Do you think it's possible there could have been some device no, I mean, there, there could have been a chip planted in me. I'm pretty sure that they did like at one a, time. Like a tracking device? Yes, yes, because um, there's been places where we didn't tell anybody where we were going. And we've met up with people. Did you have cell phones at, on no. you or no. paging device or GPS devices no on you? No electronic gear at all. So, Were you by surveillance cameras or? No. Unless it was aerial. Yeah. That would have been the only thing that it could have been. Hmm. So. Well, and that's continued to this day. That's been how long? Well, I was arrested uh, Friday the 13th of September in 1996. And this has been going ever since then. 
Um, That's 12, almost 13 years? Yes. Yeah, this has actually been going on since 88, when Franklin blew up and became an international story and hit international headlines. And, you know, oh, well, don't you else. wish you could uh, get uh, reduce the number of them? And... Oh, I've been trying to whittle them down. It's nothing near what, it, what I had to take there for a while. So, it's just... But you report regularly to um, someone who changes your prescriptions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's two different things they have. They've got a, a community service worker. It's basically like a parole officer <laughs> that comes up and sees me once a week, and then well, uh, it would feel like a parole officer. Oh yeah, well he's an, he's an ex-cop. He he's a retired cop. Well, does he have medical expertise? Not really. <laughs> So are you? You're kind of in a chemical straitjacket here. Yeah, exactly, and that's what they try to do with everybody who's in jail that they can get onto whatever drugs that they become addicted to, and when they bring you from one jail to another or whatever, or when when you are first arrested, you won't get your meds for three days. You know, no matter how badly you need. Yeah, you know, life-threatening ones and that. You might if you really, really, really get sick, but um, otherwise they they hold out, and what they'll do is they keep hitting you up trying to get a plea bargain or a confession out of you while you're going through withdrawals. Yeah, which is not supposed to be under duress or coercion. Uh, I hate to tell you, but everything in jail is under duress. <laughs> everything, and. If you make note of it, they don't like that, and you know it's not a good deal. Um, oh, I got another one for you. Uh, out at Multnomah County Jail in Oregon, um, they would regularly send in what they called the bumblebees, the the um, SWAT team, and they'd throw in a flashbang grenade three, four o'clock in the morning and just come in and then they just tear our, our cells apart and throw us out, strip searches and all that um, right right out in the middle of everything. And um, No, because I'm not familiar with what a flashbang is. A flashbang grenade is, it's a grenade that they throw in and it has a very loud percussion and a very bright light. So it blinds you when you first see it. And when you hear it, you're just, the sound and the percussion from it, it just feels like somebody's just beating on your chest. And the sound will actually knock you over. Wow. Yeah. So if you're asleep and you hear that, oh yeah, you're. It could, you can make you have a heart attack from the, the easily, shock of it. Easily, and they done this regularly. You know, it was nothing unusual once or twice a month, and the TV crew would be out there to film it for. Is the this entertainment? News. Well, what would they? What kind of story? We're, we're harassing our prisoners today. No, no, it, their their SWAT teams are in training, and. They would show close up, you know, going in and this and that and dragging the prisoners out. And, you know, you had no privacy or anything like that. Um, it was ridiculous. So, and when they, when you're first arrested, you're convicted by the media before you get even a chance to see the judge. They, they've slandered you so bad that um, there's no way that you can get a, a semblance of real life. And when you get out, they want you to go back to the same community that you came from. And there's no way you can really get a good start. No, no, what do you mean? They, they want you to go back to the same community? Well, they want you to go they back. Want you to, they, they don't want you to get a fresh start somewhere where? No, no, they don't want you to really change environments. They want you to, they do everything they can, can to get you to reoffend. They make it a point 
to make you um, either offend on something else or re-offend on the same type of scenario. It's just, it's ridiculous. So, so do you think there's good officers there that, that want to protect the public from bad guys and uh, have their hearts in the right place, or do you think it just gets lost in them? Well, they're, they're there, but they're, they're following orders. And they, you know, most of the guys are military, and they know what the chain of command is and the orders, and they don't break it. And they don't ask questions? No. Nope. No, they don't ask questions. And they don't put up a fuss or they'll be looking for a new job. And they would transfer me around often. And when they did, they would inevitably lose my meds. And they would say, well, your med list doesn't transfer from this jail to our jail. You have to wait. And then um, they have to contact whoever it was that I got the original prescription from, if I couldn't remember who it was, I didn't get the, the medication and I went through the withdrawals. If the people on the other end didn't fax him back the information to get the prescription for me, um, I had to go without it. And Could it be potentially life-threatening? Oh, it was. It was. There were, there were numerous times I went into bad seizures because of it. In jail, and then what kind of treatment or care did you get as a result? Oh, they, they lay you on a cement bunk with a um, uh, really thin mattress, or they call it a mattress, it's basically ground up rags in a plastic sheath and it's, a, it's about two inches thick and it's hard as a rock. Um, oftentimes if they want to um, uh, if they have somebody they're really trying to get to or make their life miserable to the point to where, say, they're fighting their charges, um, they offered me a 13-month um, sentence. That would be 12 months in one day for um, my charges. And I stayed in jail for 22 and a half months fighting it. And I finally got to the point where I couldn't fight it no more physically. And did that time apply to the sentence? Yeah, yeah, most of it did. Um, they put me for observation down in um, the Oregon State Hospital. It happens to be the same place where they film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> That's where I got to take a shower, folks. Oh, <laughs> great. Um, Any uh, nurses there named Ratchet? No, but um, there are things pertaining Similar. to Miss, Miss Ratchet that um, are real. Are real from her days. You know, it has her signatures on it. And, and oh, there was like a real nurse named yes. Ratchet. Yeah. At that facility. Mm -hmm. Oh my! I thought that was fiction. I'm sorry. Yeah. And then once you're in the registry, um, you've had to. Re uh, what's been the consequences of that? You've had to register your whereabouts within five days, yeah, wherever well, you go. Had to register wherever I go. Um, I have to uh, the DNA sample. Um, it was just one thing after another. And, and there have even been attempts on your life. Oh, yes. Yeah. I've been shot at three different times. Um, I've had death threats. I've um, had various threats against me and, and that as recent as a week ago and now they can also you've also had the experience of um, people actively pursuing uh, ousting you from your neighborhood oh, yeah. when you try to get yourself situated and they do it um, by means of well tell me what's happened well after I moved into another house I've done some work on it and the lady couldn't pay me, but she had an apartment downstairs, and it had a garage. And well, she certainly wasn't worried about you being some no. um, dangerous she, yeah, offender. She knew about it, and she had two daughters, um, one three and one eight, 
and because she knew you she, well enough to she'd know. leave me home to babysit them yeah. um, you know there was no problems there at all and I'd lived there about a month or so and registered and everything else and then lo and behold here comes Norfolk Police Department at their finest and knocking on my door and and um, I wasn't home well they went upstairs and, and brought with a, a mud shot like a wanted list and on the top of it it had sex offender on on the top just printed out in big bold letters and they brought it up to the person upstairs to the lady that um, owned the house upstairs and goes to her kids do you know who this man is to her kids to her kids that were age eight and three and anyway he the the kids opened the door and, and so they're terrifying the kids they're terrifying everybody and they are terrorists yeah <laughs> and anyway they um, said to the lady and all you know he's this he's that and the next thing and it's nowhere even close to what happened and it's just the fact they read um, something on a on a uh, rap sheet and on plea bargains the deal was the one charge I would take and everything else would be dropped and expunged and it didn't as happen. soon as I took it it was just like I got convicted of everything they never expunged no. the other false charges no so. What about the daycares? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, the daycare center across the, the way. Um, well, you have to be a 500 feet away from uh, school, so um, or a daycare. So I went and measured out. I was 528 and a half feet away from the school. No problem. I, you know. Ask them at the sheriff's office, is there any problem with me living here? No. Well, that was when I registered. And then lo and behold, here comes Norfolk's finest. Or so they think they are. And um, they come in and, you know, oh, you're living too close to a daycare. And I go, well, I looked for signs. I didn't see no sign. Oh, they've got a fenced-in backyard. So you were, you should have assumed, because someone had a fenced yard, mm. it was your responsibility to assume that they had a daycare center with yeah. no sign. And he goes, well, there's, there's cars going in and out of there all the time. You know, you should have known it. I, you know, could have been a drug dealer. I don't know. They got cars going in and out of them places all, all the time, too. So. Well, and aren't some of these um, people so uh, ass ag aggressive that they will actually find that someone, a sex offender, has, has located in the neighborhood and they will surreptitiously start a daycare center yes, within, right. they'll find someone within the yardage yes. requirement and ask them to start a daycare center without a sign. Yes. So they, they could will. come in and evict you. They will put up the money they will put up the resources to start a daycare center within the area and what they've done is they've went across the city and basically mapped out the 500 feet limits so they basically put them a thousand feet apart from each other and covered the whole city they cover the whole city I moved in the only place that, that I was able to and and now and that's and like across the a street from the police station yes. and the fire station. How do you feel about maybe there are people, maybe the majority of people, or it's justifiable for some, somehow that that uh, they shouldn't be around people's kids or they, you know, I mean, I can understand yeah. the concern of parents mm -hmm. if there is somebody who's who's been convicted of something involving young children of a sexual nature. But how, so, um, so we sympathize with people who want to do good to protect their kids, but sometimes it's just 
I think they need to leave the, per the prosecution of the law up to the, the people, the, the professionals. Leave it to the judge. Yes, and not to some vigilante citizens who really don't know the whole story. Yeah, the vigilante citizens and the vigilante officers. That's, um, they had in the jail where I was at in Multnomah County, they had four people killed. Um, around the time I was there. What's the name of that county? Multnomah. Can you spell that? M-U-L-T-N-O-M-H. In Oregon? Yes, it's Portland, Oregon. And they were killed by the guards. They, they, they had a fellowship called the Brotherhood of, of the Strong. And the guards were um, uh, officially uh, relinquished of any wrongdoing, but they were reprimanded and um, by uh, being discharged is what uh, one of them was discharged and I think the other other three or four were were um, reprimanded. So they got away with murder? Yes. And Does it ever expire this? Uh... Well Yes and no, but usually what they do is, see in Nebraska, it will expire on certain levels. Um, it'll expire in 10 years after your last um, incarceration or police contact. And Police contact? Well, they can yeah. contact you for any reason mm -hmm. or non-reason. So anyway, what they do is they bring you in on bogus charges right before the 10 years expires and then you have to start all over again and that's they know the law well enough to just play it and manipulate oh, exactly. it to their advantage exactly and it's it's really a shame um, in school they need to be teaching these kids about law not everyone's going to end up in jail but everyone can end up in jail and the way they've got the system set up and the laws set up they can you know if mother Teresa was still alive they could arrest her I'm sure um, my background's electronics engineering but when I go into um, a company and say oh, you know tell them you know I went to school at MIT and you know, DeVry, uh, all hunky-dory, but if, when they see that you're a convicted felon, a lot of times they don't want anything to do with you, especially when it's a sex-related felon. Yeah. So. Well, I can understand people's concern, but I just want people to know that, you know, there are exceptions. To, I mean, not everyone who's convicted is rightfully so. Oh, exactly. There was a lot of people that I seen when I was in jail and in prison that do not need to be there, should not be there. Um, there were so many people that were in, in jail for things that they should have just been written a citation and to show up in court or send in money for a fine. And that's, they, they say stress overcrowding in the jails it's not that way. But it's a private, it, it, it's a private for-profit industry now. Yes, yes, a lot of it is. They don't let you um, study. I wanted books to read to um, better myself, and about the only thing we could get would be science fiction and Zane Grey novels. And not very much meat in those no, books to work with. You know, and the, that's you know, Louis L'Amour stories and that, they're, they're nice and all that if you like old westerns. You might get a magazine, but it may be 10 years old. Um, you But you can't further your education. No, you can't, and they won't let you. They won't let you take a correspondence course. They won't let you get textbooks. They won't let you take a correspondence oh. course? Oh. That surprises me. Yeah. Um, they won't let you do anything in jail. 
and you know if you want to go to the law library they give you if you're lucky a half hour once a week and you're supposed to be able to write down word for word exactly what it says in that book because you can't photocopy it because there's no photocopier mm -hmm. that works and, and they even like, a practice lawyer couldn't target what they need no, in a half hour I, I know work. lawyers that were in jail that couldn't do it and they give you one piece of paper and a pencil if you break the pencil lead you're screwed and if you write enough to fill that piece of paper and, and still have time left you just sit there and wait for them to come get you. Uh, can you update us on what's happened since, um, oh, since the last major interview you did? Well, there was a, a connection at that time with the Hunter Thompson because he, yes. uh, that was in February of '05 that he supposedly uh, shot himself while I was talking on the phone. He was shot. He, he was shot. Know. That wasn't a shot himself deal. <laughs> well, but people say he was talking to his wife. So how yeah. would the? Uh, I don't. I don't know what the what particular. deals was, but knowing what I knew about Hunter and what was going on, somebody offed him. Was he trying to come forward with? Uh, I don't know. I think he was. Um, I didn't have much contact with him, and what I had, I didn't. I wasn't too impressed with the man. So, well, you know his uh, his uh, his assistant Nicole Brown even wrote articles about how of living with him and how she, he tried to get her to sit down and watch snuff movies with him. Mm -hmm. and she refused. Yeah, like that was entertainment or something. Yeah, you know? he was a bizarre person. <laughs> He's got a lot of fans for some reason. Yeah. Yeah, I know there's been people coming out of the woodwork trying to debunk me left and right because of what I've known about Hunter Thompson firsthand. And well, they haven't succeeded, have they? Maybe in their mind. Because <laughs> you know. he offered you money to... Yes, a great deal of money. What, 100000 or something? Yeah. Not just once. Yeah. And it was a couple different times. It was usually through Larry King. So Larry would be the one putting up the money? No, Larry would be the one facilitating it. Arranging it? Yeah, arranging it. And I don't know where the money was coming from. But, you know, it was just not a good deal. Um, I refused. I didn't want any part of it. And because of the people that Larry King was associated with and and seemed to be the puppeteer for, um, I didn't know who to turn to to even turn something like this in because um, it could be right my own death sentence. Well, that hasn't improved much, has it? No, <laughs> no. No, my life hasn't, isn't much great, better than that. You know, it's, it's probably death sentence would have been easier. <laughs> well, no, we don't want to wish that for you because we're glad you're still around. Um, what were the specifics on the, the trip that you made where you went to Vegas and you picked up Hunter Thompson and went to Bohemian Grove with him? I didn't go with Hunter Thompson. You... That wasn't Hunter Thompson I went with. You just asked if I'd been to Bohemian Grove. Yeah, okay, but I, I, you, but Hunter Thompson was... That was around that time that okay. you said Hunter Thompson was... Well, I know. Those were, those were the questions that came but up. But you swung by and picked somebody up at Area 51? Area 51 was, was a... Um, uh, where we landed one time with okay. the chat. Okay, okay. And um, they auctioned some kids off. Yeah. Yeah, is what, what I could make the best of it. And the kids looked like they'd been drugged up. And the kids didn't go on the plane with us. They went the other way with the others. With whoever purchased them? Yeah, basically. 
and then went to Saudi Arabia and other places Whatever. like that. Yeah. But there was some occasion where I thought the story was that you flew into Las Vegas and then and picked up Hunter Thompson and went to Bohemian Grove no. with him. No, somebody, somebody misinformed you on that one. That, that what am I? What am I scrambling up? What? Sort out the facts for Hunter me. Hunter Thompson wasn't in on that. I met him in New York City. Okay. Really? You never crossed paths with him no. at Bohemian Grove? I don't think so. I may have before I met him. Oh. I didn't know who he was. didn't know who he was, but... You know, you meet so many people, it's hard to remember everybody, especially 20 years long ago. <laughs> but that was... That one you must be mistaken on because that wasn't Hunter Thompson I flew into Vegas for. Who was it? What's that? Who was it? That that was the kids that got auctioned off. That's oh, where okay. Vegas came from. That was the only Vegas. Yeah. Other okay. than that, I lived in Vegas for a while, and I went down there with with um, Ted Gunderson. I lived with Ted for a while, which was interesting. Uh, but you ended up, um, very shortly after giving the Michael Corbin interview, how, how long after that were you uh, uh, arrested? See, oh, that was in April. April, probably July, I think, June, July. I thought it was so, just a few days after, but maybe not. Yeah, I've been in and out so many times on, on that failure to register, I couldn't even keep track of when, uh, when the dates were. Well, I thought that was just used in particular <clears throat> that time to... Uh, yeah, well, every time I give an interview and it's made public, I usually end up in jail. Well, we hope so. that doesn't happen. Oh, um, uh, and when you ended up in jail, uh, I know that Ted Gunnerson had said you were uh, interviewed regularly by men in suits. Yes. Would come to your jail cell. Yeah, men in black. <laughs> we'll elaborate on that. Well, they would come in. Um, everybody from the FBI on down. Did they, you, so you knew you could see identification who they were. In some least. cases, yes. In some, some cases. cases, they just said who they were, and it was left at that, and they wouldn't produce. ID even if I asked for it and I had no way to retain it because my short-term memory is basically fried because of the medications I'm on. That um, they put you on while you yeah. were in jail. And <clears throat> it's just not. So what do you think happened? I mean what uh, was the purpose of their visit? Basically to debrief me to find out what I knew and who it, who it actually implicated. And that's what it was, was, you know, Franklin went all the way to the White House. And, and that implicates? That implicates a lot of people. And... Um, but it even goes beyond that, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Now, there, it goes on, you know, the people who control the the puppet strings, and, you know, that's, it's scary, you yeah. know, to say the least, it's very scary. That these people have that much power, and yeah. that they are not using it for the betterment no. of us. No, no, they're, they're doing it for their own good, to either cover their butts, or to um, push along their own agenda. Well, do you think that things that uh, were involved in the Franklin scandal were um, to compromise people and to, so that they would have political advantage over them? Oh, yes. Yeah, there was blackmail and, and all that done. It was a, they basically had a honeypot scheme set up, you know, where um, they would get political people or people in power or that have money or whatever to um, engage with sex with um, men or, or underage kids or whatever. And then either they would be video videotaping it secretly or 
or somehow recording it. Did you ever do any video no. taping? No. Just photographs? I, I do mainly photographs, you know. Um, and on that stuff, I wouldn't, I didn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. You didn't get involved in no. the actual no. uh, blackmailing of No. The... But, you know, I knew that it was going on there again. Who do you go to to tell? You know, you're not, you don't know who your friends are and you don't know who you. But somebody must have thought that your pictures were, uh, uh, would put some people in jeopardy, their careers or. Oh yeah. 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 Did they, did they blow that out of proportion or was there some. Um... There's meat to it. Yeah. There's <laughs> some it's, cause for that. It's a T-bone steak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so what uh, do you think that they, uh, besides the this sleep deprivation, the medication, all these control mechanisms they used on you, mm -hmm. we think it went beyond that, the, your programming? Oh yeah, yeah, they use subliminal programming where they would um, use recordings in your sleep or when they thought in jail they did oh yes oh they yes they came in and they would um, come in and and um, they would play an endless loop tape um, in jail uh, basically um, you're guilty your your um, uh, you know, take the plea bargain because it's the best way out and things like that. And then showing cop shows over and over and over again about how the um, perpetrator has been arrested. And uh, that that was their form of entertainment is what they made it to be. But they had a, a two hour endless loop tape that played over and over and over again. Well, not to mention that that would just interrupt your your subconscious uh, recovery during your yeah. dream state. That would be boring to have the oh, same yeah. thing over and yeah, over. And they, they play, played it 24 hours a day. You know, so you might be trying to take a nap in the daytime. You'd still be listening to it. Could you use earplugs? They wouldn't give them to you. Could you? They wouldn't let you form use, your own. They would. They were contraband. If they Earplugs found. for contraband. Yeah. Bernheim cautions that the same technique could be used to create a false witness in a court of law. But what he sees as potentially dangerous, other researchers seize on as potentially beneficial for police agencies and intelligence services. Through hypnosis, mind control, brainwashing, you create a new identity in a person. You create an amnesia barrier between their ordinary identity and the new uh, identity or altered personality. The newly created identity can be used for uh, actual operations, that is, explosives, infiltration, surveillance. If the person is captured and tortured, since they don't know that they have this other part of themselves, they'll never reveal the information and they'll go to their death not knowing what's going on. One of the experiments that was done was to hypnotize somebody and then ask him uh, to kill somebody. In other words, to see if they would pull the trigger. As a result of the atrocities at Dachau and other camps, an international code of medical ethics is adopted called the Nuremberg Code. The various criteria that were set out in the Nuremberg Code was an overriding principle. The voluntary consent of the subject is essential. The newly formed CIA begins to study ways to control the mind. The clandestine projects are given code names such as Project Bluebird and Project Artichoke. Since the subjects are unknowing, the U.S. government is in direct violation of the Nuremberg Code.
As one of them told me who was involved in this, he said, we didn't want to do it on, on housewives in suburbia. We chose the people in society who could offer the least resistance and who would be least likely to expose it, or if they did expose it, it would be least likely to be believed. They went to the underworld, to people around the drug culture, to pimps, to prostitutes, uh, to prisoners, and the like. And those were the, the populations that were chosen. The CIA turned to George White for help. He has given thousands of dollars to set up covert CIA testing centers. White rents apartments in New York and San Francisco and furnishes them to look like high-class residences. CIA researchers record the proceedings behind two-way mirrors. And the idea was that if anyone figured out they had been drugged, they had been, were in such a compromising position that they wouldn't report it to the police, and if they did, who would ever believe them anyway? To the CIA, depatterning also has obvious significance for intelligence work. In 1957, they begin funding Dr. Cameron's work. What Cameron did at the CIA's instigation was to put together a specialized three-step brainwashing experiment, which was conducted on unwitting people that violated every ethical standard that the medical profession had been formulating for the past 50 years. At the CIA's instigation, Cameron devises a three-step brainwashing experiment. The three parts consisted of first, what he called depatterning. Second was trying to program in new patterns of behavior by playing tape-recorded messages hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times. The final phase was a two to three week period where Cameron would put patients to sleep using uh, barbiturates to try to suppress any recollection of what had been done to them. It sounds crazy, it sounds like a Frankenstein type process, but the fact is he was president of the American Psychiatric Association and nobody called his act at the time. Why don't you go to Montreal? There's this famous doctor there and he'll give you an assessment. And when I woke up five weeks later, this is according to my file because of course I can't remember any of this. I was a vegetable. I was, I'd never been in this world before. I, I was a baby completely. I didn't know who I was. I was incontinent. I didn't know anything. During repatterning, Linda is dosed with a number of hallucinogenic drugs and depressants while a speaker under her pillow plays a continuous audio loop. The tape loops that were over and over and over and over were literally for uh, weeks at a time. But for every involuntary human subject who is able to uncover his or her role in CIA experiments, experts believe there are many more who will never know. There's been thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people subjected to really damaging unethical experimentation. And indeed thousands of people who have suffered as a result of government mind control experiments are probably 99% unaware. In 1975, after President Ford appoints the Rockefeller Commission to investigate past CIA abuses, including their drug program, reporter John Marks begins searching for any remaining CIA documents relating to mind control experiments. One of the real fundamental abuses uh, of secrecy in our government still today is the misuse of national security not to protect information that actually has some bearing on the national defense of our country like how to make an atomic bomb but rather to hide misconduct and embarrassment about misdeeds that have been done by the government. You don't get protection by becoming the guinea pigs of the forces you pay to protect you. Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, when I deposed him uh, in, in Virginia several years ago, he was completely unrepentant. And uh, it's chilling to sit across the table from uh, the man who was the architect of so much human suffering and have him say, I was just a patriot. Yeah. Yes, folks, if you haven't been there, please go. Try it. Enjoy it. You'll love to stay. <laughs> and I was having seizures and, and uh, 
Were they the the the, the big grand mall kind or the no, little? The, they were edit malls. Edit malls yeah, or the absinthe. The absinthe. Yeah. Why don't you describe that? For people who don't know what that is. An abs a pettit seizure is where just a particular part of your body, like your midsection or an arm or neck or leg or whatever, keeps having spasms that you cannot control. Um, an absence seizure is where you become basically absent and you don't know. You're just mentally gone. Yeah, mentally gone. You might be able to pick up on a couple different things, but you cannot grasp what's going on at that time. Well, that could be... Now, that just started after you had the um, injury from... I was in Portland. I would gotten out of jail, and I was riding my bicycle, and I was intentionally hit. There was a car going by about 50 mile an hour. They honked their horn, I turned around and looked at them. They opened their back door and hit me on my bicycle. Do you have any recollection of who it was? or? All it was was a white Toyota, it was the last thing I remember. And I was out for approximately 45 minutes. And you hit your head on the railroad track? Yes. Going at... Yeah. Well, they were going at 50. And yeah. So how were you rescued? I wasn't. I picked myself up. I you drank. laid there for 45 minutes? Mm -hmm. Unattended? On the railroad tracks. Oh my gosh! You could have had a train run over you. Wouldn't be that lucky. <laughs> or a car. Yeah. But nobody came no, by and... the car wouldn't have got me. I, I was off on the side in the ditch. And nobody noticed you driving by and stopped? No. It was a, you know, somewhat deserted. It was an industrial street. And, you know, it was a major thoroughfare, but it was... But how did you get yourself home from there? I picked myself up. I went in all bloody. And one of the places where I washed windows, I went in and I said, I need to clean up. And they, you know, they didn't even recognize me. And I'd washed their windows there just a day or two before. Because of the... The blood and the... You know, swelling and swelling and everything else and, and um, I didn't have insurance so I didn't want to go to the hospital and so I laid laid up in my storage shed for a few days so and that's all the treatment you got for that yeah I wonder if that could have prevented the seizures if you'd had better well, treatment maybe, at the time uh, but so so now, as a result of that, you are not allowed to drive? Yes. Cannot drive because of my seizures. And uh, how often does this happen to you? Well, sometimes 10, 15 times a day. That you'll have the absence? Yeah. Yeah, and they're not really noticeable by people. I'll, you know, I'll notice I'll be having light seizures and then you know, about every couple of weeks or so, I'll get the heavier seizures. I haven't had, I've only had three grand malls. Only? Were, Those are big time. Oh yeah, you flop around like fish out of water. Now you're also taking medication for depression. Oh yeah. Which, um, now do you think that's mostly organic depression or do you think it's from emotional circumstances? Oh, stress. Stress? Stress is a major cause of it. Well, now, didn't you say you had some symptoms that started when you were in the service? Yes. And yeah. that was before Franklin? Yes, that was in 85 and 86, and Franklin was 87 and 88. Yeah. So. And so you think that there was something given to you or yeah. in there the Army? Yeah. There was a drug called TGAN. Called what? It was an experimental drug called TGAN. TGAN? Yeah. T-G-A-N is all I ever knew it by. And what was it? I don't know what it was used for. You don't know what it was supposed to do? No. But you know that it made no. you, gave you depression? Yeah. Did it have a similar effect on other people that was around you? I don't you? know. I don't know. I no. was railroaded out very shortly after that. <laughs> so. Railroaded out of the service? Yeah. Yeah. And what were the circumstances of that? It became suicidal. Oh, they you know, just from didn't... it, and it was just 
Uh, they give you a medical small, discharge? No. They give you an honorable discharge? No. They, they gave me what's called a TDP. It's a training discharge. What in the world is that? Yeah, that's what I said. It's a strange critter. It's like I never even existed in the military. <laughs> can't get benefits, can't get anything. They're just disavowing uh, any uh, responsibility for you. Yeah, exactly. After what they did to you. Yeah. That's just strange. So, so then the depression got a lot worse um, during Franklin, or? Well, after I was in Franklin, it got pretty bad there for yeah. a while. After I realized what I was in, when I first started out, I was a real happy camper. Because it seemed like the whole world had just opened up to you. Oh and yeah, you know. Expensive clothes and fancy jets, private jets. Yeah, here I was finally getting the, you know, the contacts I needed to be a photographer, and I'd been paying my dues, and and finally made it big time. Here I was, um, on a private jet, flying all over, and and taking these... photographs at the fundraisers mostly, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what it, what I was doing, and you know it. It was just amazing. Here's a little plow boy, and all of a sudden, he's in the big time. And, and you adapted pretty well. I mean, you. Well, I try. No. <laughs> I could do it again real easy, but. <laughs> it, it's higher social circles. Yeah, it's just. But then yeah. it all came crashing down. Yeah. When you realized what you'd gotten into. Mm -hmm. When did you? Re at what point did you realize uh, there was something that wasn't right, and that you were in over your head? Well, when I started seeing Larry um, doing various things that weren't quite kosher, like there was one day that um, one of the first things was he gave a stack of money to, or well, it was a, uh, an envelope of money to um, police chief at Omaha. Oh, yeah, yeah, he was. He, he basically was able to cover most anything up for Larry. And that was a regular. That wasn't a one-time. Yeah, that occurrence. was that was a regular thing, and as far as I could tell, it was about once a week. And the stack of hundred-dollar bills, I would, you know, I measured it. it out later with money that I had had on my own, and it came to about fifty thousand dollars per week. Yeah. What do you think he was covering up, or did what did you know he was covering up? Well, I didn't know at that time anything. But at that point, then I started seeing all these different things where he was sending kids to different, um, you know, uh, events that he had going on. Who was? Larry. Larry. Larry was. And then they'd have the parties for the people, and then afterwards they'd have sex parties for the special people and the kids I noticed were staying for those parties and then I'm and these were kids that were unsupervised by adults that oh yeah well the adults that were there shouldn't be supervising kids <laughs> you know? that's basically it do not leave your kids with those type of people yeah and but the kids were um, not protected by any guardians no they were no they were there as the the sex toys they, and they how they the play things. How they acquire the kids? Um, Larry had a daycare center, and he took in um, orphan and, and. Now you say he had a daycare kids. center, but there was a different person who was the actual owner, right? He tried to shut it down. Yeah, no. Well, the the actual owner didn't. It was the person who owned the building. Oh, yes. So way did I understand? So did Larry actually own the business of the daycare center? I. He put up the money for it. Okay. I don't know if he was a silent partner or exactly how it, yeah. how it actually was, but that was the purpose of it. You know, he was trying to do all these philanthropic things for people and, you know, be this wonderful philanthropist. But That was mostly a yeah, it was, cover? Yeah, that was a ploy. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, was, that was definitely a decoy. Yeah. So. Well, you said he had a lot of techniques for um, manipulating other people, whether oh, they knew was it good. was coming from him or not. He was good, you know. And you'd be, if it was somebody near him that that done something that he didn't like, you know, 
he didn't, well, a lot of times he didn't approach it himself and he would just see that the person was removed um, a lot of times physically or that through a third party and you know whether they be beaten or or you know sexually abused or whatever. Were they ever removed by termination? Yeah you know, they'd be terminated and, and things like oh, termination in, in the different sense yes. <laughs> I mean termination as in? The ultimate termination. Yeah. Yes. There was by Larry's order. Yeah, there were people that were. Wow, that that would have to really create a, an insecure situation for you. Oh yeah, yeah. And you wouldn't know who. Uh, there was one guy, he, from what I understand, uh, was hit by a cement truck. Was a guy or a child or? It was a guy. It was a guy, younger guy, and um, you know, it was supposedly suicide. Uh, suicide with the aid of a cement truck? Yeah. That's yeah. hard to do. So, um, another one supposedly had his head blown off with a 12 gauge Was that a, a, an accidental suicide? Or? Yeah, supposedly that was an accidental suicide. So, okay. so they said from, through the Wadman's office. <laughs> Oh, so they get to write up the reports on yeah. how things happened. So, it makes life interesting. Well, now, everybody just cringes at how just awful, awful the whole Franklin scandal was. Was it an isolated case? Or was it the only savings and loan that, uh, no, or credit union? No, I understand, Larry had done this three times before. And you never hear hear about the other ones. So, but he built up and crashed the three three um, credit unions, and that on the East Coast. But that was his intent, right? Basically. Was, I mean, everybody might see that as a other people might see that as a failure, but that mm. was. Yeah. Well, this one. Warren Buffett's wife, from what I understand, put Susan. up the money. Susan, yeah, um, put up the money for, for the Franklin, the Franklin Credit Union, so to help the underprivileged people of Omaha. I mean, do you think she really had a, a good heart and was trying to? Yes, Susan did. You know, Susan, I do believe, you know, was acting from, you know, trying to better things. This is something I just was reminded of the um, the the other photographer that you were made up to look like. No. Oh. And and during the um, Benassi trial, you actually had to take your shirt off to prove that you that I didn't have a didn't scar have a scar on my right shoulder. And uh, on your back. Yeah, on my and I don't you know the, all the kids said that he had a scar. And I don't have a scar there. I ran into the guy a couple times, and um, I think his name was Nick. That's only th I think it was Nick. You know, that's what comes to mind right now. But it's been a long time. And you've never heard that. anything about what's no. happened to him since. No. Well, this has been 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, hard. but but if he was brought up in the trial as a as a material witness. You'd think he'd be summoned, subpoenaed, or... Well, they didn't know who, who he was. That, that's it. You know, how so do you track all, him down? So he stayed out of... He managed to escape. But he actually was more involved in the... He was the one that was doing the kiddie porn and all that. The hardcore. Yeah. The snuff films and everything else. Well, do you and think I he's even still up alive? To be the boat. Probably not. And if he is, he's out of the country. Yeah. So... Yeah, and they wanted to pass that off on you. Yeah. How many times did you go to Bohemian Grove? Once officially. That was an interesting answer. Yeah. Did they even have an official guest list? I don't know. It's, that was basically the one time where where I was out and open to see what was what. 
Okay, and then unofficially, you stayed behind the scenes, and you were there again once or a couple times more? Three times. Three times? So was that during the Bohemian, during the gathering of the big yeah, big wigs? Yeah, the burning of the, of the owl, Malik. the effigy of the owl. Yeah. yeah. So, and mock sacrifice, right? Yeah, from what we understood. <laughs> well, the public... Yeah, they burned a mock. <laughs> no, no, no. They, it was supposedly there are children sacrifice, human children sacrificed there. Yeah, I. It doesn't surprise me one bit. Yeah, but you, but if you were there at that time and you were behind the scenes, you probably witnessed. Yeah, well, I, I seen things go on, and that was basically it. But well, the stuff that Benassi writes about being in the. Yeah, well, the snuff movie with the the, the other little boy. Um, um, yeah, the things like that went on. You know, I seen something like that. Um, yeah. You know, the, well, that's got to be pretty horrendous for anybody who has to. That's it. After, I mean, even if you're prepared, for, you think you're you know, prepared for it. Yeah, after the army, I didn't. Really? Didn't phase me. But you didn't see much. combat in the army, did you? No, but you saw enough otherwise in training in that that oh, you training. were just numb. And that's part of the desensitizing process that yeah. probably puts you through. Yeah. But yeah. still, I mean, that's just... And, you know, who do you go tell? You know, if you're going to say something like that, here's an upstanding citizen and in the community, and, and here's what he would call a street urchin, you know, that's what he thought of the, the kids. There's too many about. upstanding members of the community that aren't upstanding at all. Yeah, so... Especially, it seems like the higher they rise in the ranks of mm -hmm. political power... The more they get away with. Well, the more that they're forced to become part of the corruption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or they don't rise. Exactly. Yeah. So to true. me, it's almost like, by definition, if you are... When you ran into Johnny Gossip in uh, Portland, mm -hmm. that was, uh, had to have been around 2003, 2002? Two, I believe. 2002. Was. Did he go by Johnny at that time? Or... I don't know what he actually went by. Um, I didn't ask him. You weren't introduced formally, and no, I knew who he was. Yeah. And well, had you known him before then? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Well, I, I, I hate to go over ground that you've covered a million times, and people should know by now if they've listened to your other interviews. But you also um, went with Larry King to off at Air Force Base. Yes. Multiple occasions. Yes. Like about how many times? Do you were there? Half a dozen, dozen maybe, and Larry would go through the checkpoint and just drive right through. Which is, I mean, even bird colonels probably have a tough time doing yeah. that. Yeah. So, and he could take anyone with him, mm -hmm. no matter who you know, they it, were. It with. was just like he had diplomatic community. Maybe. He, well, what did you witness firsthand at Offit? Well, it was basically like your. MK Ultra projects, your your uh, Monarch and things like that. But what did you Mind see? Mind control. Um, where they were doing the psychological um, uh, conditioning, I guess would be the word so I'm looking for, um, and to make it to where people would be suggestive, you know, like almost similar to hypnosis, but they could do it using trigger words and things like that. Did they have some high-tech uh, instrumentation? Oh, yeah. You know, they had all the electronic gadgets you money can buy. You know, it's the government. They, they have unlimited funds, basically. And what did you see as far as the equipment or...? Well, I couldn't make out exactly what anything actually okay. was because I don't know the field well enough to yeah. actually name. But did you see subjects, children yeah, or people that were... they'd be hooked were... up and they'd have like the... 
electrodes. Little probe, probes on them. And electrodes? Like, yeah, you know, electrodes and, you know, electrode cap. And, um, you know, it was just basically running them through the paces. You know, they'd look for people with photographic memories. They'd look for people who um, were, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, like telepathic to where they could, you know, one subject would see a card and think of what it was. ESP. And the other one, ESP, yeah. Um, in another soundproof booth away from them or another room away from them would um, be able to guess or or know what the other card was in the other room and uh, uh, remote viewing things like that and so I was actually getting good at that one. <laughs> you were getting good at remote viewing? Yeah. And how did that work? Yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> you know the remote viewing was you could place yourself in another basic time. Well, you're physically remaining physically in one here, place. But mentally, you were in the other um, realm and experiencing it with all your senses. With all your senses? Yes. Now that's amazing. It, 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 was, it was bizarre. But I was what getting, did what did uh, they used to enhance that? Were there any drugs given to you, or um, it was usually just um, repetition of doing it? Well, how did I mean? How did they instigate that? Because that's almost an out of body experience. In, in a way, yes, it was. Um, did they put you in a like a, a sensory deprivation chamber, or it was yeah, dark? There and was it, different or, way, you know. How did they? That was one way they could do it. Um, they would put you in a soundproof room to where you just lay in the bed or sit in the chair. Um, they would play music, um, you know, something that was relaxing. And it was basically a form of hypnosis, of self hypnosis. As you, well, so how would you were were the were the viewings that you saw remotely were they was there an element of fantasy or was it reality? It was or? more reality. I mean, you know, I couldn't place who or what or when, but I could make out events that were forthcoming, um, things that would happen and precognition. Uh, yes. And it, they'd be accurate. They'd be accurate. So you actually time traveled, or it was cool, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it was more than just remote viewing; it was time travel. Time. Yeah, and you could go future viewing. You could go back, or you could go forward. How far would you go? You could go back in a hundred years if you want. And, you know, it was hard to to get where I was at. I couldn't pick a precise time. I'd just go back. And that, that was basically it. I'd, I'd actually forgotten about that. And, <laughs> you know. Well, going back, it seems like it'd be a little easier because there's... Back is... You, you can it's historically... Easy. The head. You know, it going ahead... And the head gets scary because you see things happening and then you witness it in real life and you don't quite catch what all the nuances, but you'll see something and it's like deja vu. It's a boom, I've been here. And it's like, okay, this happens, that happens. I know what's going to happen next. Can you give me a for instance? Well, it's people I would run into. Um, events like uh, being arrested. There was 
places that I was taken, there was no way I could have ever seen them before other than being arrested and being in there. But I knew where I was. I knew what, what it was and everything. And when they had me in Leavenworth, that was one of the places where I knew I'd been there, you know, seen it before. And, you know, it was just really, it makes, makes your skin kind of crawl. You know what a lot of people call deja vu is just, oh, yeah. is just a, a smell or a, just a passing yeah. flash. So this was much more than that. Oh, it was more than that. You would, you would actually see minutes of time. It may not be all congruent. You may see a little piece here and then a minute or two and then a little bit more later or days later or something like that. But when I was traveling, it was the same way. And the thing was, even if you seen it coming, you couldn't do anything to change it. And you know, it, that was something that when I when I went to jail, when I was first arrested, I was starting to get good at. And when I um, got in jail, the stress level was so high that I lost track of how to do it. Well, so when you were getting good at it, was it because you were being encouraged by the program you were in? The Maybe. I don't know exactly what. But it wasn't strictly your own personal no, it, choice. No, it wasn't or, my own choice. Uh, uh, but there was, there was underlying, be, you know, it was like being a puppet and having a puppeteer or a handler. There's a couple pl major players in the in the Franklin case from Omaha that have since passed away. Yeah, uh, Alan Bear. Alan Bear. Um, Peter Citron. Peter Citron. Um, let me think. Who else? Uh, is Harold Anderson still around? I think he is. I think he is. You you were out to his uh, farm. Yeah. What did you witness out there? They were. They were doing, you know, little boys mainly. That was the main thing, and, and they had a little sacrifice going on. You know, it was sort of like a cult worship. And they sacrificed one of the children. Yeah. And that was done how often? I don't know how often, but, you know, I was out there that time. Was it on a significant date? Like, uh... I don't remember. Uh... I don't remember if it was anything like solstice or... Yeah. Or something. A satanic, uh, yeah, high holiday. holiday or something. Yeah. I don't follow the sat satanic Well, did they have stuff, rituals but... that went along with it? Yeah. Yeah, they'd, they'd have rituals and things like that. They didn't just go up and go, oh, like, <laughs> whack, <laughs> you know. So, but. And how many people would attend? Well, there was probably half a dozen, maybe ten. So. Were they pretty high-powered people? The. Uh, I guess so. Oh, you didn't know all of them. I didn't. I didn't know. You know, I made it a point not to know a lot of people. I was told not to ask questions and not to ask who people were. Remember, you said at one time you said you uh, left copies of your photos with three different people, and one of them you know you could trust, the other one you didn't weren't sure about. Mm -hmm. Did the person that you weren't sure about end up being somebody? Somebody I shouldn't have left. You shouldn't have trusted. Yes. Burned again. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's there's still a set left. In I, Colorado. I don't know of. There's still a set left. <laughs> For your life insurance policy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you have that because. Yeah. Given the circumstances. It probably has kept you alive. Mm -hmm. I know when I was arrested, I'd done very well in school, but I had nothing to prepare me for what was to come. And 
you know, the justice system and that was nothing like what I've been taught in school. It what didn't come close. And you know, is there a way for a, a well prepared person to to come out uh, attaining justice if they've been falsely accused? Rarely. Is it just the it stack is just so a lot of money takes a lot of people behind you and you know if you're just one person you have to to rely on the public defender you might as well kiss it goodbye because you know there's no way you can go to defend yourself if there's things you need to get you won't be able to get them phone calls are recorded and we had evidence that would have set me free and would have put a lot of people in jail and I told my brothers where to go to get it and it was a bad snowstorm and they drove four hours to get to this abandoned farm place and when they got there there was fresh dust from the walls being beaten in with a sledgehammer and if you want, I'll take you up there tomorrow and show you. <sighs> I could get some video of that. Yeah. yeah. With the bullet hole still there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's still there. And we yeah. have... It's not going to be there much longer because it's going to be torn down. And it was a nice place. It just oh, didn't have to... it was a beautiful to... place. It was a showcase. You know, so... And somebody ought to be held accountable for that. Oh, I know it. I know it. And the evidence was destroyed. It was gone. Yeah, it was taken. Yeah. It was taken. You know, they beat everything to a pulp. You know, all your your correspondence, if you write anything in jail, they got a picture of they've scanned it. And they keep a copy. And what if people write to you? Same thing. Anything that you get in is scanned and tested for drugs and anything else for contraband. Do they do they, they uh, record take... the, the names and addresses of the people who write? Yes. And put them on a list? Yes. So but how would you how would you suggest a curriculum for school age kids? Oh, they need need to have, you know a law class, you know, not just government but law and to where they learn the Constitution and memorize it word for word and understand what the words mean because so many constitutional rights are broken when they are arrested but the other thing is is keep meticulous notes that you were good about that oh, I was very good about that I can tell you what I did to within 15 minutes Every day. But didn't they confiscate all that? Everything. I had apple boxes full of notebooks. And they confiscated everything. They confiscated a book I wrote. A book you wrote about what? It was basically all the things that I'd been through. Oh. And it was like a biography? Yeah, it was Life and Times of the Wandering Vagabond. <laughs> that was the title? Yeah. And, uh, you know, just basically told about the different experiences and people I'd met along the way and the fun we'd had and uh, the good times, the bad times, the people that made things not so rosy. Um, you know, it told about Franklin and, and some of the things that went on in there. That's why it was destroyed. Yeah. And supposedly the judge or the, the judge had ordered in court that it, everything was not to be um, destroyed. It was supposed to be retained preserved. and preserved. And you know, I've never been able to get it back. I've tried. So you know, I got a big heart 
and I try to help help people out, and that that can be a gift and it can be a detriment. <laughs> well, it's one one of the reasons I like you, Rusty, because you are genuinely a good-hearted guy. Oh, thank you. So, you know, you try to help anybody out, but I'm getting cold and calloused in my old age. <laughs> yeah, but you can't. Got burned too many times, and you just still, have to be more selective, I yeah. guess. And I hate being that way. Yeah, I know. It's like John DeCamp refuses to lock his car. Oh, I got Because trouble. he lives in Nebraska, and that's what Nebraska means to him, is you should be able to leave your car unlocked, damn it. I locked his car one day. <laughs> we we'd went to Omaha, I believe it was, that day, and we got back. And he pulls in the parking lot, and I was brought up. You go to these towns. I don't. You know, we leave our cars unlocked on the farm all the time. But you go into town. And you, you go into it. town. You lock the doors. You know, because you don't know who's lurking around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, uh, I got out of the car, and I, I wasn't thinking, and and I said, John, you know. Got to lock your door. I'll I'll get it. And I locked it and slammed the door shut. And by the time I said that, he goes, "The keys are in there." Oh. <laughs> so we're entering the house. It was uh, where Rusty was staying, where you were staying in 1988. And uh, you were using this shed down there as your dark room. Which was actually the, also a... Started out as a wash house. Wash house. Yeah, they used to have a kettle there under a fire. And Grandma would cook up the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> cook up her lye soap and do wow. laundry. So your grandparents lived here? Yeah, this yeah. was Grandma and Grandpa's place. This is where Dad grew up. And it used to be really a nice show showcase. All and the buildings were painted every year. Wow, and then okay. when you were um, incarcerated in, what year did you say that was again? It would have been probably 97. 97, and, and you had to talk to your brothers mm -hmm. over the phone that was being um, listened to by the yeah. authorities and tell them where the evidence was that could have gotten you off. Mm -hmm. And it was in here in the desk. And so your your brothers drove up in the middle of a snowstorm immediately, spent four hours driving up here, and this is what they found when they got here. Yep. This beautiful, pristine house had been... The front door had been kicked in. Um, the door had been locked all the time. The front door had been kicked in. They went upstairs and, and um, beat the walls with a sledgehammer and ceiling and uh, they shot up the all the appliances and broke every window out of the house and took the photographic evidence yeah, took, took everything that I had took your cameras here. yeah took what else I just basically took notebooks and pictures and camera equipment and just cleaned house and they it. left the writing on the wall yeah and left military shell casings which you had analyzed. Yep. So who would have access to military ammunition like that? Hard to say. <laughs> FBI? Probably. That's what we were figuring it was. Yeah. So. Well, let's see what they did. Okay. I hope we got enough light because all the all the windows have sheet metal boarded up. So they did this scribbling here. You got your light, your light in front of your lens, put it over over your over the top of your camera. Put that down. And uh, so they did the scribbling which doesn't really look like it says anything. Barnes Hall did the other. Thing. What's that? Barnes Wallow did the other. Oh. And they left a nice little message. 
You are all dead. Mm -hmm. But they weren't quite clever enough to spell your correctly. And we got broken out windows. General ransacking. Go over and see the other room. It's the same thing. We bashed the wall in here. Sledgehammer. That's where the chimney was up there. And we broke the light. There was a beautiful oval window in the front door. It was all etched glass. Where was that? Right there. That was the front door? That was the front door. I got busted out. I was go over there and you can see in the, the side room there. Just okay. Step over the cushion. And, you want me to go? Yeah, you go first. Or if Make sure you get tangled up. How long do we have with this light? So here we got more broken out windows. This was my framing shop. Oh, look at all this framing. Destroyed. There's so they did all this too? They pulled all the drawers out? Yeah. Knocked over the shelves. That was one of my first waterfall pictures. Pretty. That's up in Casper, Wyoming. With barnwood. Yeah. Right. That's nice. And then there's, there's my girlfriend. She got murdered. What? Yeah. What's her name? Irene Vobarney. They mm -hmm. found her up in Alaska. She'd been murdered. When was that? Oh, a couple of years ago. What's the back story on that? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what the story is on it. Did it have any connection with you and Franklin? No, I don't think so. We're going to go up the stairs. They're kind of steep. Are you testing this? So what happened here? Well, this is part of what they broke out. Or is this just the weathering from no. the damage? I'll show you where they started. Kind of grew from there. Pour that room all up. Pour this room all up. Was this a storage room? I had everything up organized and that. They just tore it all up. Huh. And here is where they busted the wall up. This is, where they is this where you were Come over here. sleeping? Yeah. So they just bust. Put your light right over the top of your camera and you won't they get just, bad shadows. They, get ba they just bashed out that wall. Yeah, I had a desk sitting here that I had some stuff taped to the underside of it in one of the drawers. And instead of taking the desk apart, they ripped everything apart and beat the desk up. Did they do the damage to yep. the ceiling? Yeah. So. Tore up the ceiling real good. Broke out the windows. So this is open to the sky now. Another <coughs> sledgehammer mark. And then the, this was full of pictures in this closet here? Mm-hmm. And they took? They cleaned that out. 
took the pictures. Left some, but you see that, how thick that mirror is? I busted that up. It's a pretty thick mirror. Yep. That was a wall mirror. Yep. This is downstairs bath. This is my winter dark room. Your winter dark room. That one snow got too deep and I couldn't get out to the door. I used this one. So there's developing trays and chemical jugs. And then the bathtub you probably used for the... Yeah. That was my sink. For dark room sink? Yeah, the bathtub became my dark room sink. I'm upstairs. Did they splatter that red paint there? Mm-hmm. Supposed to look like blood. Yeah. At the same time as the main house was ransacked and destroyed, this little outbuilding shed, which was my workshop, my workshop, was ransacked and yeah. sledgehammered. Yep. And I didn't. I think it's a one, two, three, like third board up, um, and then go over. Oh, that's that's an exit. Yeah. Pull it all. Yeah. And you had what kind of trees again? It was an apple orchard, and then there were some cherry trees. With hogs and cherries and plums and apples and veggies, you could live quite well. Yeah, with lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. <laughs> That, that's quite a picture, Rusty. Yeah. See, I did actually be skinny once upon a time. You said that was a leather tux? Yeah. I've never heard of such a thing. For just a year out of your life of trying to work a, a, a job, this is this mm -hmm. is the consequence. Yeah. So. Well, Rusty, I do hope that people will um, at least consider your case and maybe a few others of extenuating circumstances and give you a break because I just think it's long overdue. Oh, thank you. That's... Thank you. Thank you.